In this video, we're going to be learning a little bit about the region called the root of the neck. Uh, technically, we can say that the root of the neck is a junctional region between the neck and the thorax, and between the neck and the upper limb via the axilla, as you can see over here. The way that we have a communication between the thorax and the neck is actually via an opening, which is called the superior thoracic aperture. I can roughly outline it here with this pink pen, and we can also name the features that constitute the boundaries of the superior thoracic aperture. So if we think about all the boundaries of the superior thoracic aperture, we can see that posteriorly we actually have the T1 vertebra, so that will be this one down here. Anteriorly, if I move it over here, you can see that we have the first rib. See how it curls underneath the clavicle on the right and of course then also on the left side. Anecdotally, this is actually the reason why you can't palpate the first rib because, well, it's kind of hidden below the clavicle. Yeah, so the clavicle is obstructing the palpation ability of the first rib, so to say. And uh, you also have the superior border of the manubrium down here, which is the anterior border of the superior thoracic aperture. We have a superior thoracic aperture. As you know, in anatomy, the name is usually the game. That means there has to be an inferior thoracic aperture, which would be down here then. That would actually be the um, opening and the connection between the thorax and the abdomen. It's not really an opening. There's the diaphragm there, but there are a couple of openings, like some hiatuses that pass through the diaphragm that will allow, for instance, the aorta and the esophagus to pass through, amongst other things that usually traverse together with these large structures. Things that pass through the superior thoracic aperture, I've also outlined in this little um, text box that I put in here. You can see, for instance, the trachea passes through. Posterior to the trachea is the esophagus, this muscular tube. Then you have large arteries and large veins. You have nerves, for instance, the vagus nerve and the phrenic nerve. And you have some lymphatics, which I've actually, to keep the picture a little bit tidier, I've hidden the lymphatics here, but you actually have the thoracic duct and the right lymphatic duct that would also be passing through the superior thoracic aperture. If I take our anatomical model here and rotate it sideways, that we can look into the axilla, we might be able to appreciate that the axilla has an opening or kind of serves as a conduit for all the major nerves and vessels and lymphatics that pass between the root of the neck then through the axilla and the upper limb. The opening at the apex of the axilla is actually triangular in shape. It is easier to depict in an image However, the boundaries would be your clavicle, the first rib, again, which we can see up on top, the superior border of the scapula, which we have here. So the superior border of the scapula would be running along here, and passing through the axilla, as you can see right here, is going to be these nerves, which are all parts of the brachial plexus, the subclavian artery, which turns into the axillary artery as it enters the axilla. If I follow this up here, we can see back there is the subclavian artery, and the subclavian artery can be divided into three parts. And along with that, we also have parallel to the subclavian and then the axillary artery, we have the axillary and subclavian veins. If we look at the aperture, so the superior thoracic aperture, and focus down here onto the lungs, there is an important little factoid that you should really be aware of, which is that the apex of the lung, as you can see up here, it's also called the cupula, okay? So this will be co covered with pleura, which is this membrane that lines the lungs. You have a visceral part, which cannot be peeled off, and a parietal part that will be lining the internal aspect of the thoracic cavity. Well, the cupula of the lungs will extend above the first rib or basically, in other words, you can realize here that the apex of the lung and the cupula of the pleura that covers it will project all the way through the superior thoracic aperture and into the root of the neck on both sides. So, 
Bearing that in mind, your first clinical correlation for the day is that if you think about penetrating wounds, for instance, a gunshot or a knife wound, and these things are unfortunate, but they do happen, if these types of injuries involve the apex of the lung, of course they can allow air to escape into the pleural cavity, which will lead to air in the pleural cavity, which is called a pneumothorax, yeah, and that will then lead to collapsing of the affected lung, or actually it'll lead to atelectasis of the affected lobe of the lung. In the root of the neck, we have a couple of very important major arteries. Okay, To do that, I'm going to go ahead and hide all the other organ systems and only leave the arteries left over for us. So what you see now is basically just our vascular system stripped down to only the arteries. And you have here the arch of the aorta. And one of the first parts that comes off of the arch of the aorta is the brachiocephalic trunk. Right? You have the brachiocephalic trunk, which as the name implies, think brachia means arm, cephalon means head, so it's a trunk that will supply the arm and the head. Okay, the next artery that will be coming off here is going to be your left common carotid artery, and then you have your left subclavian artery. Okay, you actually have two arteries coming off here that will go to the left side of the body because on the right side you have this trunk that is larger that will then actually form the parent artery or the parent vessel for the common carotid artery on this side, whereas on the left side it comes off directly from the arch of the aorta, at least most of the time. So your brachiocephalic trunk, as we see it here, enters the root of the neck where it will divide into your right subclavian artery and the right common carotid artery. The subclavian artery will then continue, it actually has three parts, and after its subclavian artery it will turn into the axillary artery, and after its axillary artery it goes into the arm, arm is called brachium, so it will then be the brachial artery on the right side. And the same pattern we can also recognize on the left side. So having added in a couple of muscles as well here, here is the important landmark muscle, which is the scalenius anterior or anterior scalene muscle. Now we can see that the subclavian artery can be divided into several parts, actually three parts, uh, based on how it relates to this muscle. So here you can see that the first part or the first portion extends from the origin of the subclavian artery all the way to the medial border here of the anterior scalene muscle. The second part is very small as it lies just behind the anterior scalene muscle. And the third part will extend from the lateral margin of the anterior scalene all the way to the outer border of the first rib where it will then become the axillary artery, just about here. Thinking about the branches of the subclavian artery that it has coming off of the first, second, or third part, they're going to be as following. You can see coming off the first part, this artery here, this is the vertebral artery. And one interesting little factoid about the course of the vertebral artery is when you see that you have in the vertebrae of the cervical region, there's a hole here, or a foramen. So, well, the vertebral artery will enter through a transverse foramina and go upwards by passing through the transverse foramina all the way up until it actually ends up within the cranial cavity. Once it's up in the cranial cavity, it'll join the artery or the vertebral artery from the other side, form what is called the basilar artery, and ultimately help it uh, forming the circle of Willis, which is this very, very important vascular circle or vascular ring in the cranial cavity, without which life as we know it would not be possible. Also coming off the first part is your internal thoracic artery, which you can see here. It's also called uh, by some the internal mammary artery. Yeah, that'll kind of run caudally behind the ribs, give off some intercostal branches for the intercostal spaces here. There might be some perforating uh, vessels towards the breast and terminating in the superior epigastric artery further down here, and the musculophrenic artery, which goes to the diaphragm. And the third little branch that comes off here is called the thyrocervical trunk. And the thyrocervical trunk is very, very short in itself. It'll divide into the inferior thyroid artery, it supplies the thyroid starting at its inferior pole. the suprascapular artery, and the transverse cervical artery.
After this, we have the second part, and to find the second part, we have to look behind the angioscaling muscle. So why don't we go and do that? Let's kind of dive behind here and see if we can find our costal cervical trunk. And lo and behold, here it is. Most of the time, it does come off the second part. Sometimes it actually does come off the first part as well. But here's your costal cervical trunk. And what it does, it actually splits into the superior intercostal artery and the deep cervical artery. It'll arch somewhat posteriorly, as you can see here, over the cervical pleura of the lungs and towards the neck of rib number one, which is over here. Next is the third part of the subclavian artery. So from the third part, at least usually in the software here, it's depicted as a variant, but usually you would have the dorsal scapular artery, which is highlighted here. You would usually have the dorsal scapular artery highlighted here in pink, uh, and it would be going all the way over here. You can see how it supplies the medial margin of the scapula, goes all the way down here, but usually it would actually be coming off the third part or the second part, and so here we actually can't see the dorsal scapula coming off the third part, so we're actually dealing with a variation here, as it is in this case a branch off of an existing artery, which would be the transverse cervical artery. Okay, so now let's try to come full circle here and summarize everything we know about the subclavian artery in its usual variations. There are three parts of the subclavian artery. It is important to know that these three parts are defined by its relationship to this important muscle here called the anterior scalene muscle. Right? This is the anterior scalene muscle. That means behind it you're going to have the middle scalene and then a posterior scalene in that case. Usually, the first part of the subclavian artery has three branches, and that will be your virtual artery, your internal thoracic artery, also called the mammary artery, and then this here, which is the thyrocervical trunk. You know, the thyrocervical trunk actually then trifurcates, as you can see here, into the inferior thyroid artery, the transverse cervical artery, and the suprascapular artery. Remember that the vertebral artery will travel straight upwards towards the cranial cavity and on its way up it will start entering the transverse foramina of the cervical vertebrae at cervical vertebra C6. Branching off of the second part of the subclavian artery, and remember the second part is actually going to be posterior to the anterior scalene muscle, so why don't we have a look behind here. And you can see the artery back there. This would actually be your costal cervical trunk. The costal cervical trunk usually divides into two more arteries, which would be the deep cervical artery and the supreme intercostal artery. And then we have the third part of the subclavian artery, which only has one branch, and the third part would be, in that case, lateral to the border of the anterior scalene. Well, in this anatomical model that we have, we don't really have the dorsal scapular artery coming off of here, but in many cases you would have the dorsal scapular artery arising from the third part of the subclavian artery. However, in this case, we have the dorsal scapular artery coming off as a branch of the transverse cervical artery. In this pattern where the dorsal scapular arises as a branch of the transverse cervical is present in approximately 30% of all anatomical donors you will encounter. So next let's have a look at some of the veins that we can find in the neck. We can see right here highlighted is our so-called external jugular vein. Medial to that is going to be the internal jugular vein. Who would have guessed? Same thing on the left side here. And so the EJV or external jugular vein is important for draining blood that is primarily received from the scalp and the face. Okay, so the EJV will then term it in the root of the neck by joining here the subclavian vein. Okay, there's also sometimes an additional vein called the anterior jugular vein that's variable and will also terminate in the root of the neck. If we look a little bit further down here, I always find that it's quite interesting to facilitate our view of actually made parts of the sternum and some of the cartilaginous parts and connective tissue of the sternoclavicular joints. Uh, invisible. And now we can see up here is the superior vena cava on the other side all the way down here. 
also entering the right atrium is going to be the inferior vena cava if we go all the way through here and so the superior vena cava often abbreviated as svc is made up of the union of the right and left brachiocephalic veins remember in anatomy as i often say the name is the game and so in that case it is going to be a vein brachiocephalic that means it is described best because it drains blood from the brachium, so the arm, and the cephalon, the head. All right, good, so that is actually indeed true. It drains blood from the arm and the, or actually, I should say the upper limb and from the head region. And if you look at the two brachiocephalic veins, you can see that the left one is actually much, much longer because it actually has to arch all the way over, no pun intended, the arch of the aorta, whereas the right brachiocephalic vein has the, um, ability to be very very short because it just immediately well nearly immediately then splits into the subclavian vein and internal jugular vein this you can then split into the internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein so if i add in the lymphatics here you can see it becomes instantly very very busy but what i'd like to point out are two important structures here which we can find joining the right and the left venous angles on the right side this is actually called the right lymphatic duct and on the left side it is actually called the thoracic duct right so these are the major lymphatic routes by which lymph is returned to the venous system although important to note that the thoracic duct actually drains the vast majority of lymph of the entire body whereas the right lymphatic duct only drains the right upper quadrant that actually includes all of the right upper limb. All right, so your right lymphatic duct will return the lymph into the right venous angle, which is actually the angle between your IJV and subclavian vein. And the thoracic duct enters at the angle between the subclavian vein and the IJV on the left side, respectively. So let me go ahead and hide those lymphatics again. Good. Okay, so now we can talk about the nerves a little bit. There are going to be three pairs of nerves in the root of the neck. For this, let me just highlight all the nerves again. Good. Okay, so pretty busy. We know there's going to be a lot of nerves to find in the neck. Uh, importantly, if we think of the root, as I just said, we have three pairs. We have first the pairs of the vagus nerves, right? The vagus nerves run pretty much medially down the root of the neck here is actually the left vagus nerve. I can isolate that for us just for a second here. Here's the left vagus nerve, okay? You see it actually exits through this hole in the skull. If you've already seen the corresponding video, you will know that it'll exit out of the jugular foramen. And then it'll course all the way down the neck and it'll loop around the arch of the aorta to form, or actually to give off the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the left side, whereas on the right side, the vagus nerve, that should be this one here. Let me see if I can click on that. Yep, on the right side, the vagus nerve, well, there's no arch of the order for it to loop around. So on the right side, the vagus nerve will continue inferiorly, but the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the right side will be given off uh, round, well, around the subclavian artery. So there's a loop on both sides, although on the right side, the loop is much, much shorter. And on the left side, the vagus nerve is much longer until it continues further down. In addition to that, you also have the phrenic nerves on the right and on the left side. The phrenic nerves are gonna be just a tad further lateral to the vagus nerve, and this would be the phrenic nerve on the right side, and the phrenic nerve will actually be running on the anterior surface of the anterior scaling, goes all the way down, uh, all the way down, it goes down to the diaphragm here, and it comes originally from the levels of C3, C4, C5, because C3, 4, 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. And on the left side, here should be a phrenic nerve as well. Here's the left phrenic nerve, also traveling inferiorly in very close proximity to the pericardium of the heart. That'll be in both cases, and then it goes to the diaphragm. And last but not least, we also have the sympathetic trunks in the neck region. Although you don't have a sympathetic ganglion associated with every vertebral level, you do have a couple of ganglia that have fused together. Usually you have three ganglia, an inferior, a middle, and a superior cervical ganglion. Here's the superior cervical ganglion. 
If I isolate it, you can see where it sits pretty close to the inferior aspect of the skull. But if you're looking from the root of the neck and you kind of work your way medial to the carotid sheath and then all the way upwards, you can see here is your superior cervical ganglion. In my mind, it always looks like you have maybe like two or three beans that were rolled end to end and then someone stepped on them and squished them a little bit. That's kind of what it looks like. Remember that at this level, you will not find any preganglionic sympathetic fibers. You'll only find the preganglionic sympathetic fibers between T1 and L2 because that is where within the spinal cord you have the intermediolateral cell column where these preganglionic neurons for the sympathetic system sit. Only between T1 and L2. However, you know, fibers that need to go to the head and neck region will enter the sympathetic trunks or chains and then ascend if they have to go to the head region and then they will synapse on an appropriate ganglion depending on the level that they have to go to the highest they can go to is of course the superior cervical ganglion then they will exit via gray ramy communicans or some call them cephalic arterial ramy to then get distributed to their target regions within the head region here. So now let's have a look at the thyroid gland, which is the largest endocrine gland in the neck. Very important because we need to make thyroid hormones, but even more important, we need to make parathyroid hormones from the parathyroid glands that are embedded, usually on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland itself. Interestingly enough, the thyroid gland does not develop in the neck. That is where it rests in the end, though. It usually develops actually as a median epithelial outgrowth or downgrowth from the floor of the pharynx in the region where the tongue develops. Now on the tongue, on the back of the tongue, you have a little foramen left over called the foramen cecum, and it was connected via a well, long duct called the thyroglossal duct all the way down to the thyroid here. So in some donors, you'll have an extra lobe that comes up here. It's kind of in the midline, it's called a pyramidal lobe. That is actually quite frequent, and it's not associated with any kind of pathology. And you can see the final resting place of the thyroid gland is then here in the neck. Sometimes a little bit of the thyroglossal duct stays left over and there can be a cyst that develops that will be called a thyroglossal duct cyst. These aren't really very worrisome and they can be removed if they are bothersome or, or aesthetically unpleasing. The arterial supply of the thyroid gland is via primarily the superior and inferior thyroid arteries. You can see here's your superior thyroid artery coming off of the ECA or external carotid artery and the inferior thyroid artery down here is coming from the thyrocervical trunk. In some cases, I think about 10% of cases, there's an additional artery that goes to the middle aspect or the median aspect of the thyroid gland about here where the pointer is now pointing, that would be called the thyroid, thyroid ima artery or thyroidea ima artery. Um, that's something that a surgeon has to be aware of when they're doing a thyroidectomy because if you cut this little vessel, uh, then of course it'll bleed severely. So you need to know that in some of your patients, you're gonna have to expect that to be there. So here we're looking at the isolated thyroid gland. We're looking at the posterior aspect. Here you can see your four parathyroid glands. These here are truly endocrine glands that are essential to life because they will secrete your parahormone or parathyroid hormone that stimulates the mobilization of calcium from the bones to maintain a normal blood calcium level. So if these are overactive, it can lead to demineralization of your bones. So that means that People who suffer from this might actually fracture their ribs by even simple things like turning over in bed. And of course, they might also be more predisposed to getting renal calculi, so kidney stones. If they are underactive, it can lead to tetany, which are these very severe muscle spasms. And since, of course, the diaphragm is a muscle, if that is affected, 